You're my little button there. Good morning. How are you? It's good to see you. It's good to be up here. And where'd Mitch go? There you are. Uh, that's really exciting news. That's really, really exciting news. And 0.8 miles from here. I didn't know Mitch was going to share that, but I think uh, the conversation we're going to have in Galatians, I wrestled with this because this is kind of a strange section in Galatians. And so when they said, hey, you're going to take this back half of chapter one, I was like, okay. But I really prayed, like, what's the point? You know, there, it, it's part of chapter one. And so I was curious, like, what is it, God, that we can get out of this? And on the backdrop of you guys going, and when I say you guys, I mean the church, just moving a few blocks away and inhabiting a new space, I think there's something really important in this section in Galatians. And so I'm grateful that that news is out and about. Uh, it's sandwiched between an experience I had last night. Cammie and I got, that's my wife, Cammie, over there. Hi, Cammie. And we got to go on a date because my parents, who are also here over there, they had the kids. We went on a date and we went to a new, yeah, it was beautiful. But we went to a restaurant, and I won't say what restaurant because they need some time. But it was a new restaurant and you could feel it. Have you ever had that experience where you, you meet someone, you go into a space, you have an encounter, and you're like, yes, right? It's true. And then there's some distance in, the, in, in kind of the embodied experience. I'm, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking about some friends who went on a honeymoon, and I think they were in Italy, and of course, Italy, uh, you know, old, old, old space, and they described this family who made food, and they all, like, like they butchered the, the pigs out back, and then they cured all the meat, and I mean, that experience contrasted with a new restaurant. There's like no, you can't even compare the two. It's nothing wrong with a new restaurant. They just need time to embody this thing that you're going to taste and experience. And so that experience was last night. You just it talked about going into this new space. And I just think it, it opens up some space for us to consider what was happening to the Apostle Paul. Because he had this dramatic conversion. Jerome preached about it, Acts 9 last week. He brought that out to the forefront. And he had this dramatic conversion where his faith really went from paper to person. He knew a God in the law. He knew a God in a text that had been handed down and handed down. And he had the utmost zeal and respect for this text and this God that he knew from a distance. But then something happened to him when he met this person. When Jesus met him and said, I am Jesus, the one that you're persecuting. Paul was undone in that moment. And sometimes when we hear that story, we hear, oh, wow, Paul instantaneously gets it, right? And he instantaneously embodies everything that he's to go out and carry as a light to the nations. And that's how Paul saw himself as a light to the Gentiles specifically. That's what, if you would have asked the apostle Paul, like, what's your job description? What title do you have? He would have said apostle to the Gentiles. Like God's given me a mission, mission to carry out the good news to this people, which is really strange because he was the chief of all who? Pharisees and Jews. So he's from a totally different demographic, and yet God called him to go to a completely different people group that he would have previously said have no business being involved in this conversation. And now God's going to call him to be an evangelist, to be somebody who carries that message. And this morning, the text, what Paul is doing is he's establishing his credibility. He's saying, you can trust me that what I'm telling you, the same gospel that's being preached, you don't need to follow these other teachers. You need to stay true and fix your eyes on Jesus. He's the author and perfecter of your faith. He's going to lay down that gospel. And he says, you can take my word for it. You can believe me because I heard it from Jesus. And so he's going to establish his credibility. As he does it, he's going he's to talk about a timeline. And if you can imagine, like when you zoom in on something, you see a dot, or is, and then you zoom out, and that dot becomes a line, and you're like, whoa, there was a lot there that I didn't see when we were zoomed in. Just think about that, because we're going to look at that timeline, and why is it important? What's happening in that timeline? Not just in theory, but to Paul the person in that timeline, and I think it may intersect with what God might be doing in our church as we prepare to go be in a new place. So let's read. Let's go to Galatians chapter 1, and I'm going to be in verse 11. Again, let's back up to 10. This is what Jerome finished with last week. 1.10 says, Am I now trying to win the approval of men or of God? 
Or am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel I preached is not something that man made up. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in my Judaism beyond many Jews of my own age and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God, who set me apart from birth and called me by His grace, was pleased to reveal His Son in me so that I might preach Him among the Gentiles, I did not consult any man, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was. But I went immediately into Arabia and later returned to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Peter and stayed with him for 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God that what I am saying to you is not a lie. Later, I went to Syria and Sicily. I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea and, and that are in Christ. They only heard the report. The man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith. He once tried to destroy and they praise God because of me. I want to make sure that we know the main thing when you, because you're going to go all the way through Galatians, correct? Galatians 1, Paul's establishing his credibility. He's saying, I'm going to tell you some things later in this letter that are going to confront some things that other people are telling you. Those other people may seem to have more credibility than I do, but it's important that you understand that you can take my word for it because I met Jesus and I didn't go consult with anybody. And when I circled back up with these apostles that you have real confidence in, we were talking about the same gospel. So that's what he's doing in chapter 1. That's the context of it. The rest of your unpacking of Galatians is going to get to, is going to rest on, can we trust Paul or not? Very important. And that's what he's doing. I want to zoom into this section in verse 15 that says, but when God who set me apart from birth and called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not consult any man, nor did I go up to Jerusalem, but I went immediately into Arabia. Some context there, go to, I didn't put this up on the, the slides, but go to Isaiah chapter 49, if you've got a Bible. If you don't, that's okay, I'll read it for us. These are the kind of things that would be in Paul's mind, and you heard him talk about this contrast between zeal and being a servant. Did you catch that? He goes, I was very zealous, I knew Judaism inside and out, I was zealous for the tradition, And yet he says, I've become a servant. This is the transition that's taking place. Listen to the language of Isaiah 49, because this is a verse that mattered to Paul. It says, listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my birth, he has made mention of my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. He said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. But I said, I have labored, I have labored to no purpose. I have spent my strength in vain and for nothing. Yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand and my reward is with my God. And now the Lord says, he who formed me in the womb to his servant, to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to himself and to gather to himself Israel. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord and my God has been my strength. He says, it is too small a thing for you to be a servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. Listen to this. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. That prophecy of Isaiah meant a ton to Paul because he saw God extending his promise. He saw the extension of this, but people didn't understand how this was going to take place. And so as Paul is being recalibrated in his encounter, by his encounter with Jesus, he's realizing his call and vocation is going to be to be a light to the Gentiles. So he's moving from this zealous place of protection, like a protectionism, about the Jewish people and their tradition and their law and who is in and who is out. This is, Paul's going from this primary vocation to now all of those kind of boundaries and gates are being torn down and he's now a servant to these people that he recognizes that God so loves the world. And he's going to extend that grace out. 
This is what's taking place in Paul's mind. And he says, I didn't go up to Jerusalem. I didn't consult. Again, there's, a two, there's two things going on. First, he's establishing, I didn't get my message from them. But also we can hear in the background what his personal experience is. Because Paul, as a zealous Jewish Pharisee, has two. We read a book by a friend, Andrew Root, who describes it this way. If Paul had posters on his wall, like, do you have a Tom Brady? Anybody still have a Tom Brady poster on their wall? You can. We love him. And he did a wonderful thing for our city. And he's a good, good person, even though he left us. But when you were growing up as an adolescent, did you ha- who did you have on the wall? Anybody brave enough? Jordan, of course, Jordan. Who else? New kids on the block. Thank you. We're in the... Who is it? Muhammad Ali, the greatest, right? Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson. Yeah, I wish I could do the thing. Yeah, we, we idolized some people in our youth, right? These are the people that we wanted to be just like them. Paul would have had two of these. And our friend Dr. Root said one of them was Phineas. And if you go back to early in Numbers, Numbers 25, you go back early in the scripture, there's this character named Phineas who gets really riled up because the Jewish people are having relations with these Moabite women, with a tribe that is not of God's people, and it's, it's bringing destruction on God's people because they're secret, they're not secretly, they're openly defying God and having these intermarriage relationships with these other, this other tribe, these people who are not God's people. Phineas is so zealous for the purity of God's people that he actually goes out and he finds a couple who's in the midst of that kind of a relation and he kills him with a spear. That's Phineas. And he was recognized as somebody who was so zealous for the purity of God's people and for the holiness of God to remain intact that when he found out about these people, he went straight to their tent and ran them through with a spear. For Paul, Phineas was Michael Jordan. Paul had Elijah as his other... He, Elijah was the new kids on the block, or the Muhammad Ali. And so growing up, Paul would have looked at Phineas's poster and Elijah's poster. What's Elijah known for? This dramatic encounter, right? Where the prophets of Baal... We're saying our God's bigger than your God and they're having this contest and what does Elijah say? Well, let's sort this out right now. Why don't you get some wood and build an altar and then let's dig it up. You know the story, right? We dig it up, we put some water in it, douse the whole thing. You can yell, you can scream, you can do all that you want to do, but your God is not a living God, so he's not going to answer you. And then you can go even further and you can just make it almost seem impossible and then all I'll have to do is ask my God because he's the living God and what will he do? He'll burn up the sacrifice, the water, the ground, everything. Elijah is the prophet who accomplished that mighty work and on the backside of it, what happened to the prophets of Baal? Anybody remember that story? Yeah, he killed them. They killed all those prophets of Baal. I didn't give you any of these slides. I'm going a different direction. Go to uh, 1 Kings 19. Because this is important in Paul's mind. Phineas is one of his posters. Elijah is his other poster. Two, two heroes of the Jewish tradition. Two heroes that stood for the purity of God and the distinctive holiness of God's people. We'll run them through with a spear. We'll wipe out all of their prophets. And listen to what happens to Elijah. And this is in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 1. It says, Now Ahab told Jezebel, King Ahab, everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the desert. He came to a broom tree, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord. He said, take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under a tree and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was a cake of bread baked over a hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. 
The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled for 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went to a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with a sword. I'm the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me. The Lord said, go out and stand at the mountain in the presence of the Lord. The Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in an earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing, Elijah? He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me. The Lord said, Go back the way you came, and go to the desert of Damascus. We'll pause right there. Later he says there's, there's way more. You think you're the only one, but there's way more that haven't bowed their knee, right? Here's what's important. If you go back to verse 15, but God who set me apart from birth and called me by his grace, he's thinking about that from birth in Isaiah, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him to the Gentiles. Again, Isaiah, this light to the nations. I did not consult any man, nor did I go up to Jerusalem. I didn't get this story straight with those who were apostles before I was. I immediately went into Arabia and then returned to Damascus. Unless you kind of zoom out and you understand all of what was making Paul, Paul, that little section kind of doesn't make any sense. Like, but I thought that he immediately just got about preaching. And it says, no, he kind of went off the grid for three years. And it wasn't until three years later that he returns and he has this conversation. And we go, what is that time, that silent time, that empty time where the Apostle Paul is off the grid? What's he doing? And until you start to triangulate his new kids on the block poster and his Michael Jordan poster, and you go, oh, he grew up knowing all all the ways that Jordan shot. He probably rehearsed what Phineas must have felt like in his zeal. This is how he grew up. It was in him. He probably imagined a thousand times that game winner that Elijah hit and was like, if only I could have been there to call down fire And watch it consume and then just unleash the wrath of God on all of these unbelievers. This is what shaped the mind of this zealous Paul. Then on the road to Damascus, he meets Jesus. And Jesus looks right at him and says, Paul, why are you, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Not the one that the people you are persecuting believe in. He says, you're persecuting me. Very much in the same way he says, whatever you've done to the least of these, right? You've done unto who? Me. Paul is, his imagination is being baptized into the, the, the reality and the beauty of a righteousness that he has never heard of. He does not, he's heard of it, but he hasn't understood it. He's been blind to the fact that what God is doing is actually pouring his very life. The Trinity, God, Father, Son, and Spirit is expanding that same life and love of God and he's making a home. In fact, this is the way Jesus says, my Father and I will come and we will make our home in who? You, and so we've seen him full of grace, full of truth, that God was tabernacling among his people. He was the one, the word made flesh. All of this is recalibrating Paul dramatically, dramatically. And he's having to now in his body that has been shaped to, as Jerome pointed out, to give the approval of those who are stoning Stephen. His body has been shaped by that blood-boiling zeal to persecute and keep out anybody who would defile. He's now having to come face to face with the Jesus who's saying, 
I have so loved the world, Paul, that they, there's no daylight between them and me. When you're persecuting those who are believing in me, I have put my life, I've made my very home in them. You're persecuting me. And the mission is no longer to keep out or to keep back, but you need to understand that I so love the world. Paul understood something really at an embodied level. This wasn't just paper to person in an instant. Imagine what would have gone through your mind. Have you ever been hit with something so heavy that you said that quintessential, now I know more Southern phrase, we didn't have it on the West Coast, but I need a minute, (laughs) right? Have you ever had one of those where somebody has just recalibrated you to such a disruptive level that you say, I think I need a minute. I can't really respond right now. Wise people say things like, I have a bunch of things that I'd like to say, but I better not. Instead of kind of just shooting off the top of my head, I think I need a minute. I think I need some time. And in fact, what Paul does is he says, I think I need to go retrace the steps, right? I need to go back and do what Elijah did. Because what did Elijah do? Ran to the same wilderness. He hid. He He was being killed. Well, guess what? If you read Acts 9, it says, later on, the Jews wanted to what? Kill him. Paul now finds himself in this real tricky spot where he's been killing Gentile people and Jewish people who have converted to Jesus And he's been thinking he's zealous, and on this side, he's the Jordan of this team. And yet now he looks like a traitor to these people, and he's been formerly killing these people. And guess what? Neither of them are super excited about the Apostle Paul. The Jews, Acts 9, say, we're going to kill him. And they try, because he's a traitor. We thought you had Phineas on your wall. We thought you had Elijah on your wall. You, You were the guy. And now you're literally thinking of Phineas in bed with them, the Jesus people? Are you out of your mind? This is, this is a blasphemy, Paul. I'll kill you for that. And so Paul's like, well, I'll go hide out with these people. And all these people are running in that direction towards South Tampa. Like, get us to a safe space. You're a wild man. Paul feels very much like Elijah. I'm going to run. And I'm just going to do what he did. And so he goes into the wilderness and he goes to the mountain of the Lord and symbolically the mountain of the Lord where the law has been given, right? He goes back to the origin story and he says, what do I know that I know? What is true? God, what have you said? What is real? What is right? What is righteousness? I got to go back to the origin story. I got to go hide out. I got to get my mind. I need a minute. I need a safe place. And what he discovers is there, there's a fresh word from God. And so hear me when I say this. The first thing Paul experienced was humiliation. He went from the mightiest of this camp to the feared of that camp to the guy running from both for a bit. Because he looks like he's, he's completely lost all credibility with both. And Paul in his body is experiencing humiliation. The disruption of having to unlearn some things that he was blind for a while to, that he had taken on, that were plastered over by blind guides who also didn't see Jesus. And he became very zealous in exactly the things that were missing the point of the gospel. Hear me clearly when I say that. Plastered into Paul's being, he recognized that the faith tradition that he was very zealous for had missed the point. And therefore, he too, as the chief champion of that missing the point faith, had been persecuting, believing he was doing the right thing. And that needed to be deconstructed. He had to unlearn some things that previously he had been very zealous for because he realized as it went from paper to person that the law was actually fulfilled 
by Jesus. The love of God made flesh was now swallowing up his zeal. And that was de- this was disruptive to Paul. And so he had to go through the humiliation in his embodied person to figure that out. The second thing he needed was that fresh word from God. I think he went into Arabia because he had just met Jesus for the first time on the road to Damascus. And like the disciples, how long did the disciples get to hang out with Jesus? How many times? How many years? Three years. These other men who had been with Jesus, they had been with Jesus for three years. And remember Jesus saying, how slow of heart to people, right? And he'd been with his disciples and his disciples said, do you now want us to call down fire on this one or that one? And Jesus just rolls his eyes and he's like, give them time, right? He's had so many experiences with these other men, Jesus had, where it took him a while. Wind and the waves torn up, tossed up. They'd been with Jesus. They'd seen him do miracles. And what are they doing? They're terrified. And Jesus wakes up and he's like, why? You have little what? Faith. How long do I have to do this? It took the disciples. They got three years. And they still, on the road, after Holy Saturday or in Holy Saturday, they still were not getting it. It took them time. They needed Jesus to instruct them. They needed the Spirit of God to illuminate and help them understand not just the paper, but who the paper was pointing to, to unpack the person. Paul needed to hear from God. He didn't need just one word from Jesus that said, oh, it's not justification by works, it's justification by faith. There you go. Now go evangelize the world. What? That wouldn't even have made sense in Paul's fingernails. He had justification by works underneath the fingernails. He needed a minute to get that out. And he needed to be in conversation with a living God who he had just met. But I thought Jesus was the one that died. He was the blasphemous one that was put to death. Now I just met him and he's alive. Can we talk some more, sir? I would really like to know more about that. I would really like to not speak first, but to be a listener first. And he went into the desert, into the wilderness, to have not fire and more earthquakes and spears and all the poster-worthy stuff. He went for a whisper from God that would help him truly understand the sweetness and the wonder and the power, the unsearchable riches of Christ. He needed Jesus to unpack that. And appropriately, the, the final thing that I saw in there is time. It just took time. Sometimes we forget what it was like to like walk into the desert. To go to the mountain. To climb up that. Have you ever been on a really long walk? Anybody ever done like a pilgrimage walk? Where you go and you intentionally like do a pilgrimage in some other place? Anybody been on like the Pacific North, the Pacific Crest Trail in the Northwest? Jerome just went to Kilimanjaro, long walk. What happens on a walk? You start out impatient, right? Like, I got all these thoughts, and by the end of it, if it's a good long walk, your brain's opened up a little bit, and the stuff that you know is starting to be known. Does that make sense? And it just takes time. Do you have that quote from Russell Moore? This one I will use. These guys are like, you gave us so much stuff and you're not you. I think it was like the fourth toward the end. Maybe no, maybe not. Russell Moore, as they look for it, was the president of the ethics and religious something or other for the Southern Baptist Convention. Heavyweight in the Southern Baptist Convention, and he quit. And he quit because he quit after seeing what was happening in our faith tradition in America over the last couple years. And he said, I don't know if I know what we're doing anymore, is essentially my paraphrase. But he said this, We now see young evangelicals walking away from evangelicalism, not because they do not believe what the church teaches, 
But because they do not believe the church itself does, or because they believe the church itself does not believe what the church teaches. The Jesus you worship on the mountain, in the valley, that Jesus, I, I believe that. I believe your story. I believe the beauty of Jesus. But it sure doesn't feel like we do. Because when we go out of here, it becomes really about dividing again and keeping people out and away from us. It really becomes about sticking a flag in this ground or that ground and then fighting viciously like Phineas style back and forth for who's got it, right? It feels a lot like memorization and left brain articulation and not a lot like being in love with food, if you're the restaurant analogy. You cook chicken, but I don't know if you've ever eaten it. And so when you bring it, there's not the warmth of somebody who's eaten that chicken. You tell me about the systematic theology and the doctrine of justification by grace through faith, not by works, and yet you're striving and wrapped around the axle about things that totally contradict the beauty and the wonder of a life that's given and a theology that says it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ living in me. And this is not something that I can accomplish. This is not something that I can earn or study for. This is a miracle that comes when I meet a man and his name is Jesus. And I walk away and I go, you go find him and ask him yourself. All I can tell him or all I can tell you of this man is that he offered me drink that would not run out. And I drank it. And now out of me is pouring living water. My question for us before we go 8.8 miles away is, have we eaten chicken? Have we drank the water? Have we been through humiliation and deconstruction of the zealous traditions that have been given to us, that have put spears in our hands and boots in our feet and sent us out to be a light or a lethal weapon to whoever comes against the faith? Have we been through the deconstructive humiliation to say, I wonder what God is doing in this incredible new covenant that fulfills the old covenant? I wonder if we've been through that. I wonder if we've heard a fresh word from God. I wonder if you have a desire for intimacy for the one who revealed himself to you. Has it, has it been lost on you that what Paul said, he, he didn't, it was not lost on him. If you hear him carefully, he says, I recognize that in my mother's womb, God called me. For Paul, he's going back and he's saying, do you realize... When I was Pharisee of Pharisee, when I was the embryonic version of that Pharisee, God was working in my life for his purposes. I never saw God there. In fact, I've, an, I've annihilated, I've hidden that, so I'm ashamed of that story. Paul says, no, I, I recognize that he was making me an apostle of the Gentiles from the beginning. He called me and set me apart. And then he revealed himself to me on the road and talked to me, not persecuting me, not not throwing me down and phineasing, or phineath and you know his name, not spearing me. He spoke to me and he he let me encounter him face to face. No one had ever had that experience and yet here he is. I wonder if we've been through that. I wonder if we've been baptized by that time in the wilderness. If we've gone and sought out not the fire and the smoke and the earthquake, but we've listened and said, Jesus, I want to hear you speak to me. I want to hear you speak to me because I want to let you nurture this life that you've given me. It's not my own, but you've placed it in me. And I want to know how it matures. I want you to make yourself more in me. I want to decrease. I want you to increase. And you are the very source of that life. I can come straight to you. Jesus, would you mature your life in me? I wonder when the last time we've had a desire for intimacy. And I wonder how long it's been since we've felt the felt experience of not having been brought up only by zeal or pressured into zealous activity to go evangelize our city. But what if the community of faith was a walking community? And what it was to be the church was to be on this pilgrimage, this journey to discover the wonder that continues to unfold. And I promise you, it will continue to unfold because the minute we think we've got the entire thing, guess what God does? He says, let me unfold some more to you of who I am and the depth of my love. 
Let's keep walking together. Let's enjoy time and fellowship together. And maybe as a church, let's for a season recognize that it takes time. And maybe we can't go through this in a weekend. Maybe it can't be reduced down to six weeks in a course. Maybe this becomes a life together of seeking after letting Jesus manifest his life in us and desperately hanging on to his word and desiring for it to become real, embodied, fleshly words. I think this is what Paul instinctively recognized as his pride. And he was the, I mean, I will use this one. Go to the Philippians verse. Listen to Paul's language. Paul in Philippians chapter 3 says this. If anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ. Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes through the law, but the righteousness which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. Listen to this. What does he want? I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained all this or already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. When Jesus is praying for his disciples in John chapter 17, he says, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me. That's us through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved me even as you loved me. Father, I want those who have been given to me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you. And they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make, them know, make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself might be in them. Here's my encouragement an invitation for, for us as individuals, but I think really importantly is to not think of about ourselves as individuals in this context for this conversation this morning. It's individual. There's things I'm sure that we're kicking around as we thought about Paul's life for you personally. But if you take Jesus' prayer and you take Paul's experience and you take Paul's thirst and hunger to say, I want to know Jesus. I've forgotten everything else. I want to know him. And I want to know what it is to have his life living in me. And you take Jesus' prayer, God, that they would be one. Every single one of them. This distributed life of Jesus that makes them one. Beyond their age, race, gender, status, everything. That there's a oneness in this room. There's a oneness in our life, not out of any other thing, but because the life of God is being poured into all of us. Jew, Greek, slave, free, male, female. The wonder of that becoming visible and manifest. That took Paul three years. It took a wilderness journey. It took a fresh word from God. It took humiliation and some deconstruction. It took him walking it out. But that's what qualified him to be a light to the Gentiles. That's what allowed people who had their first impulse to lean away from Paul to lean back in and get that head nod because they go, wait a second. 
This guy does not seem like the Paul that I heard about. Why is that? And it let him become the one who shared not traditions of the faith, but he said, let me tell you about Jesus. I know him. What a beautiful gift. My prayer for us as a church is that we'd have a desire for humility. What would it look like if we just were a confessing church that said, wow, there's a lot of stuff that we don't know yet and we want to learn more of God. We want to know him, not just at our head, but at a heart level. What would it look like in our city if we confessed and repented that over the last maybe decade, there's been some stuff from the traditions and evangelicalism that have been piled on the message of Jesus and it's made it pretty gross. And we, had to, we have to figure that out. We got to wrestle through some of that stuff so that we can get back to the thing that is the gospel, which is Jesus. A righteousness. What if we slowed down Even though we have timelines, even of that, what if we just really even gave ourselves the grace to know, man, we're walking this out. And that's a wonderful thing. And so whether you're on day one of the deconstruction or day 35 of having God build you back up, we all know that it's, we say this often, let's get more interested in long and slow and deep. I think it's really important when you see that thing from Russell Moore that says, hey, young people are not really interested in hearing from people who don't embody the very things that they are talking to us about. And I think we need some time to let that catch up. And that's okay. That's actually a really beautiful thing. I'm going to ask us, we're going to pray together, and then I think we're going to do one more song. And as we worship, I just... Think about those three words, humility, desire for intimacy. Let's put it that way. Humility, intimacy with God, and time. Let's pray.